you are going to be listening to The Birch Bark House. You need to have your book in front of you, and you should be ready for Chapter 4 on page 51. The world changed when Father was home. Everyone had to be more careful and orderly. When Mama and Grandma were in charge, there was a way to do things, of course, and yet there was room to make mistakes. Mistakes were funny and could be fixed. With Omakaya's father, Mikwam, or Ice, everything had to be done exactly right. He was a commanding person, over six feet tall, and with a shrewdness in his expression that impressed other men. Often, he dressed himself quite handsomely, full turban, beaded velvet vest, calico shirt of fine red cloth, a bandolier bag, earrings. He always wore at least one fancy earring, and it glittered and spun at his jaw when he abruptly halted or changed direction in his walking. Mekwam was very funny, and the camp was always full of laughter, but it was an uneasy laughter. At any moment, Dede's mood could change to barbed annoyance. Much of the laughter had to do with her father's sly wit and sharp tongue. There was no one he could not imitate, no one who escaped the sharp humor of his gaze, no one about whom he could not make a joke. He even teased old Tallow, but he loved giving her little gifts, too, and in the evenings he told stories until way after the owls began to call. With Dede home, things were more exciting. Things were more difficult. Things were less predictable, but somehow more secure. The first thing Dede noticed was the corn, how tall it had grown, how the rain had plumped up the ears, and what a good crop they had this year. Mama and Grandma were pleased and contented with the crop, but Dede was jealous of the amount of new corn he saw the crows devouring. Early on the morning of the second day he was home, he cut poles and used basswood twine to rope together two platforms, one on either side of the cornfield. When he had tied the legs securely, and when he had positioned them just so, he called Angeline and Omokaius. I want you to climb up and stay here and drive away the birds. He gave Omokaius two smooth sticks to clack together to frighten the flocks, and Angeline his tattered old shirt to flap in the air. He didn't need it any more, for Mama had made him a new suit of clothes, a calico shirt, skin leggings, a set of blue broadcloth breeches trimmed with red wool. On to the shirt she had sewn four carefully hoarded brass buttons, gleaming, each marked with the French flower that the voyagers called fleur de lis. Now on a sunny day, with a sweet haze in the air, and the promise of rain low and far at the edge of the horizon, Omokaias and Angeline started for the cornfield. They argued back and forth about everything and nothing. Stubborn and bored with each other, they fell silent. The garden place lay at the end of a short path through the woods, and on the way they walked without a sound, each lost in her thoughts. Perhaps because they had fallen into that angry silence, they walked quietly enough to come upon old one horn, the magnificent buck deer who had lost half his antler rack defending his island territory. He seemed to have damaged his head in some way, so that only one of his antlers grew back properly. It was a beautiful antler, proud and pointed. The other was only a stump. Unafraid of the girls, one horn stepped out into the path and stood alert in the early light, basking a little, warming his coat. Omakaius and Angeline stood still, held by his beauty and the strength of his gaze. His graceful, leaf-shaped ears tilted forward as though he could hear their hearts beating. His brown eyes were commanding and kind. He took a step toward them and stopped. Another step, stopped, and then suddenly, as though yanked into the air by a giant invisible rope, he leaped. He disappeared. He must have heard something we didn't, Angeline said. And sure enough, Dede was behind them, right behind them with no warning. What's wrong with you girls, he said, his voice sharp. The crows are feasting while you stand here and jabber. He walked past them, his stride long. They hurried to the field, climbed onto their platforms, and shooed away what few birds had settled in the corn. 
At first it was fun to wave and shout across the field from their perches. Boozoo! called Amokayas. Boozoo! called Angeline. Nindondi wissin! Amokayas yelled. I'm hungry too! was the answer. What did you bring to eat? Angeline had brought nothing. We could roast some corn, suggested Omokayas from across the field. We could roast some crows, cried Angeline. How will we catch them, shouted Omokayas. I'll get Nokomis's fishing net, Angeline answered. We'll throw it over them when they land. So far, not a single bird had eaten so much as a kernel of corn because the two girls were making so much noise. But as soon as Angeline left her stand to fetch the net from Grandma, a whirling crowd descended. The smart crows and red-winged blackbirds knew when their chances of getting a bite of corn had improved. The crows spread over the corn with cries of greed. Ravens, bigger and smarter, waited on the outskirts of the field to see whether it was safe to join the feast. Determined, Omokayas yelled louder and clacked her sticks. She had helped harvest each seed saved in Mama's seed bag. She had watered those seeds with water hauled from the lake, makuk after makuk of water, until they sprouted and grew. Then she had loosened the earth and weeded with Mama's big moose antler hoe and her own smaller hoe carved from a crooked tree branch. She had guided these corn plants and worked hard, and she was not now going to give up the winter's dried corn soup to a flock of birds no matter how hungry they were. Again, the birds fell on the corn with starving cries. Again, Omokayas ran screaming to drive them off. Dede was right. The birds' eyes glittered greedily as they tore into each plump ear of corn and pecked at the juicy young kernels. Their cries were ferocious. Until her sister returned, Omokayas ran from one end of the field to the other, shouting, flapping her dad's old shirt and cracking the sticks. After a time, she was too tired to run fast, and her shout came out as hoarse, or as a croak as hoarse as the crows. Angeline returned with the net, finally, and they tried to cast it over the birds. The net worked much better at catching fish. However wide and gracefully they tried to toss it, the net always flew clumsily. The birds saw it coming, darted off, and even seemed to laugh when taunting cries as they landed, eating noisily in another part of the field. We've got to trick them, Angeline said. Trick them how? Omokayas panted. I've got an idea, said Angeline. They draped one of Grandma's nets carefully over the corn stalks to make a ceiling. Angeline stood behind. The corn stalk room with the other net held wide, and Omokayas ran to the other side of the field. When the birds landed before her, she slowly, unhurriedly, with no shouting and no sudden movements, walked toward her sister. The birds hopped before her or flew a short distance. They were not frightened enough to wheel high in the air. They continued toward the net and then slipped under the nets to forage, hopped further beneath, toward Angeline, until they finally ran into the wall of twines and flapped high into the ceiling of the net. In alarm, they panicked, tried to fly through the links Nokomis had woven, and caught a foot, a wing, a tiny head. Even though she hated them just an hour before, Omokayas now felt badly about betraying them, and as she drove the birds into the net, she begged them to forgive her, saying the words she heard her grandmother use. Forgive us, forgive us, we have need, we have need. She turned away as Angeline caught each struggling, flapping bird and broke its neck with one quick, strong twist. They harvested birds for the next hour, and the next hour, until the sun sank low and the remaining birds withdrew to their perches for the night. Then, as Omakayas was gathering in and folding Nokomus's net, she noticed one bird was left, struggling hard to free itself. It was a young crow from a late nest. Although it hopped up and down with great energy, it couldn't quite fly. They already had a pile of birds large enough to fill the biggest parching tray, which Angeline had fetched from the camp. Omokayas decided to set this last bird free, and she gently undid the basswood fiber twine from a sharp black clawed foot, its neck a ragged baby feather wing. Holding the bird in her hands, she set it on the ground and waited for it to fly off. It sat still, 
When she tried to shoo it into the air, it only hopped a few steps, dragged a hurt wing. Almost Caius looked around for a heavy stick to club it, to put it out of its pain, and then something stopped her. She looked down at the bird. It gazed up at her with such a calm, trusting curiosity that it almost seemed to speak aloud. Its round eyes were a deep milky blue, and it cocked its head sideways, back and forth, to get a good look at Omokaius. She looked around to see if Angeline was watching. She wasn't. With a swift movement, Omokaius reached down and scooped the bird into the small carrying sack at her waist. It nestled in so silently that she soon forgot all about it. Omokaius and Angeline spent what seemed like endless time plucking the birds, cleaning them, scorching the pin feathers, those just growing in, too tiny to pull off. When the birds were ready to roast, Mama packed them close together along with wild onion bulbs and then pressed rich steam bed muck carefully around them. She set them in a pit in the middle of the fire and leaped and heaped live coals around the bald mound of mud. As the birds cooked, bits of steam broke through the tiny cracks in the mud and scented the air with a delicious fragrance. A few ears of ripe new corn, blueberries, and a strong tea of wintergreen made the rest of the feast. When the birds were done, Mama used a stick to roll the ball of, mud, ball of birds from the fire, and then she cracked open the baked mud. Sitting down together around the fire, they ate roasted ears of corn, sweet blueberries, and picked the delicate meat off the tiny bird bones. Each bird was no more than a few mouthfuls, hot, tasty, spiced with the oniony brown flavor. There was more than enough to fill each person, and they were all satisfied. These are my daughters, said Day Day proudly. Not only did they save the corn today, but they caught and plucked our dinner. They are hunters. He took his pipe from his bag to smoke it and their, in their honor, and each girl felt a warm, proud sensation. They leaned back a little, looking into the fire, and Nokomis also took out her woman's pipe. She filled the bowl with kinikinik, tamped her pipe carefully, and lit it with a glowing stick. Omokaius wanted to ask her for a story, but she knew that her Nokomis always refused, no matter how hard they begged, until the last frog was safely sleeping in the ground. Day-Day, with his half-white blood, could often be persuaded because the stories he told were different from Nokomis's. Hers were Ariosokan stories, meant only for winter. Day-Day usually talked about his travels, the places he'd seen, and the people. The close calls and momentous encounters with animals, weather, and other, Anishabeg, and best of all, ghosts. After he had smoked his pipe, at Angeline's request, Day Day spoke. Day Day's ghost story. We were coming out of the rapids about two days from Boatwing, in a part of the river I know all too well, when I tasted a storm. The last thing I wanted right about then was a storm. I wanted to get my men in our canoe past that spit of land. It's shaped like a little hook and juts out into the river. The name of that place is Where the Sisters Eat. I wanted to get past it because we were hoping to catch up with a certain trader and sell to him. Besides, as I'd heard it, nobody liked to camp there at Where the Sisters Eat. Strange things happen at that place. Still, when the sky opened and rain poured down, I decided that my fears were foolish. As much as my men wanted to go on, I decided we had no choice. They grumbled, but we pulled into shore, dragged our canoes up to the drier ground under the pine trees. By then, the rain was driving down, hard. The wind was shaking the trees. There's no question of making a fire. We just had to wait it out in the cold, in the dark. So I heaped pine needles and soft branches in a bed, rolled myself under the canoe in my blanket. So far, everything was fine, I thought. Maybe the stories I had heard about the place were lies, things that never happened. I turned over to try to get a little sleep. I had barely dozed off when a sudden shaft of lightning hit near, struck a tree that crashed down in the woods. All I could do was hope I had chosen a lucky spot where lightning wouldn't strike, where no tree would topple down. I should have taken my tobacco out right then and offered it up to the good spirits. I should have remembered my mother's ways, but I did not. And here's what happened after I fell asleep again, the next time I woke. I came awake with a jolt uneasy. Too quiet. That's the first thought I had. Too quiet. No rain, no wind. 
no moonlight either. The clouds hung thick and heavy as a priest's black wool robe. I waved my hand in front of my face, couldn't even see the barest outline. That's how dark it was. That's when I heard them. I heard the women arguing over the bones. There were, of course, no living women within hundreds of miles, but I was groggy and didn't think of that. All I could think of was how loud these women were talking. Hey, you ladies, be quiet. Someone is trying to sleep here, I called. For a little while, they lowered their voices, and then their argument broke out again, and they started to shout. They had settled down to quarrel near my canoe, and now I was steaming mad. Beckon on, I yelled at them loud and harsh, to be quiet. Again, they lowered their voices, but just as soon as I got comfortable again and started to doze, they broke into a loud chatter once more. It wasn't that they sounded ugly. Their voices were high and sweet, though they were having a disagreement. It was just that they were so loud and right over my head. Sitting on the canoe, I heard their weight creak on the spruce ribs. You be careful out there. I was getting even angrier. They took no notice of me, just continued their excited disagreement. Here is what they said. You give me the first meat, sister. You take the first bone. Give me the second meat. You take the first bone. I'll have the foot. I'll have the head. No, you won't. I'll have the head and the leg, too, sister. How shall we divide the others? Let's gamble for them. Let's. It's a good thing we raised that storm, said one of the sisters, laughing. How else could we catch our food so easily? My stomach hurts, was the answer. It's been a long time since we caught this many. Then all of a sudden I understood. I was the first meat, the second bone. We men were the food. The ghostly sisters had come to hold their feast. Us! My sweat turned cold. I remembered all too well how bothersome bad spirits were, even dangerous. These ones had perhaps starved to death, and so were eternally hungry. They themselves had revealed how they struck up storms to force travelers to seek shelter. No wonder my men hadn't wanted to camp out on the spirit of a spit of land called where the sisters eat. Dede fell silent, and, ev and then and stared into the fire at the center of the wigigan. Nobody said a word. Even baby Niwu seemed to listen horrified as Dede thought about his next move, how he would save himself from the cannibal, cannibal ghosts. Dede finally went on. Here's what I did. Luckily, I thought of my father's advice. Never let your mind, never let fear take your mind away, he said. Always think. So instead of giving in to fear, I put fear aside and thought. And into my mind, once I let myself hear it, a plan came. Immediately, I put it into action. Bam, bam! I began to knock on the inside of my canoe. I huffed like a bear and shouted in a growly voice. Wasn't he delicious, this man? Best one I ever ate. Did you hear that? said the sister above me. A bear has eaten some of our precious food. How dare that bear steal from us? They were both furious, and to make them even more furious yet, I stuck the butt of my rifle out and whacked one of their feet hard. Ah, woo, she cried. Why did you hurt me, oh, my older sister? I didn't, said the older. Did you, shrieked the younger. You and that bear, always lying and greedy. Me and the bear, nothing. Take that. Oh! Dede gave a horrifying shriek that made the skin on Omakaias's neck crawl. Heart, her heart jolt, scalp tightened with fear. She snuggled deeper into the blankets and robes next to Grandma, who held her tight. Ow! Again, Dede gave his version of the ghostly shriek. Big Pinch covered his head and crashed into Mama's lap. Dede let a silence fall and then told the ending in a hushed, spooky tone. The two sisters began to hit at each other, first with their fists, then their sticks, then with rocks pulled from the ground. While they were occupied with trying to kill each other, I loaded my canoe quick as can be. I could hear the others doing the same, no doubt listening to the sisters' plan to eat us. The men had been shaking in their blankets. Just as we were pushing off, one of the sisters noticed us leaving, and with a scream she bounded toward us. I was the last one out, steering from behind. I shouted to my men, Paddle, men! Paddle hard! Still, the evil sister managed to grab my shirt and rip it almost into shreds. 
just see. Dede solemnly produced the pieces of shirt that his daughters had used to frighten off the birds that day. Big Pinch gasped, and the girls were silent. Yes, said Dede. It was lucky I got out of there alive. And do you know, after I hit the ghost with my gun barrel, the gun split on me, refused to let me fix it. Fortunately, we did catch up with that traitor who always made such a good price to us. And luckily, too. Dede drew out the last word teasingly, which made the girls perk up with interest. Luckily, I was able to trade for a few small things. Dede drew a little cloth-wrapped package from inside his shirt. He opened the package with such care that Omokayas thought he might have brought back a live thing, perhaps a small squirrel. Or maybe she momentarily recalled the tiny bird in her carrying sack. Was it even still in the corner? Probably it was quite dead by now. Omokayas felt a pang. She focused again on Dede's gift. He loved giving gifts, drawing out the suspense, and he always chose wonderful things. This time he drew from his small sack a long, thick band of indigo ribbon for Angeline. For Mama, a precious dress length of calico cloth, deep red with blue and pink flower sprigs all over it. For Grandma, tobacco, a big twist of it, golden brown. Big Pinch received a small knife, and Baby Niwu one tiny piece of velvet to lay against his soft cheek. As for Omokaya, something special was in store, said Dede. Something he had made himself. She caught her breath. Nah, he said. Here, this is for you. He handed her the sawed-off length of his gun barrel, the one that ruined itself after he struck the ghost sister's feet. The end of the gun barrel was pinched together with tongs and given a rough, sharp edge. It was clearly, when Mokaius gulped to see it, a hide scraper. When Mama showed me what a good job you'd done on that moose hide for my, ma- my moccasins, said Dede, I decided you should have my old gun barrel for your own first scraping tool. The skins you prepared for my moccasins are very fine. From now on, I want you to prepare skins often for Mama and for me. Take this, he said. Omokaius was confused. Pride fought with dismay inside of her, and she took the gun barrel hide flesher from her father with a conflicted heart. Preparing hides, her most hated work. And now, just because she had done a good job one time, she was picked out special for the rest of her life. She would be condemned to soften, tan, and work with stinking hides. No, she wanted to say, I won't take it. I want a ribbon like Angeline's, only red maybe or yellow. Cloth, please, a bit of sweetness, a licorice stub, anything, anything else at all. But she took Dede's gift with a tender thanks, knowing how much he delighted in choosing the presents and how rarely he praised. Almost resentfully, she looked over at Dede's new moccasins. Surrounded and held by Mama's moccasins, they looked fresh, neat, and new. Omokayas had to admit the hide she had tanned was beautiful. Suddenly, her heart thumped, her throat shut. Oh, Dede's moccasin. Oh, she was sure she saw it move. It had moved. She was sure of it. Again! Nishke! Her voice trembled. She pointed. The others looked. This time, the moccasin took a big hop forward, and everyone, even Dede, cried out in surprise. They were all frozen in shock. The moccasin sat still, quiet. Nokomis leaned over, poked at it with the stick. The moccasin twitched, then squawked. Omokayas jumped up, for she remembered instantly that she'd left her carrying sack right next to the door with the moccasins. Sure enough, her bird popped its head out, right, and in the sound of everyone's laughter, it blinked with interest, cheerful. Greedy, hungry, unafraid.